Okay, so what we're going to cover today is our lecture four, which is microbial growth and control of microbial growth. So you'll get to have some good experience with this once we do the laboratory exercise that relates to it. Now, when we talk about microbial growth and the control, the first thing you have to think about is what do microbes need in order for them to grow? When we talk when we talk about requirements for their growth, there are two main categories, okay? There are the physical requirements, things such as temperature, pH, how salty the environment is. And then there are the chemical requirements. And these include things like CHO, as I like to call it, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Things like nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus and our various minerals as well. And when we talk about the chemical requirements, in a little while we're going to go one by one and basically see what each of these is needed for in the cell. But before we get to that, we're going to go through the physical requirements, starting off with... So we're going to start with temperature. And when it comes to temperature, there's a term I want you to remember which is the cardinal temperatures, okay? Every organism, including us, has cardinal temperatures, which means every organism has a minimum, a maximum, and an optimal temperature, okay? So when you hear cardinal temperatures, think the minimum, maximum, and optimal temperature for that organism. Now, if there is a temperature that is below that organism's minimum temperature, then that organism is going to be considered metabolically inactive, okay? And the term you'll hear associated with that, that you have to remember, is bacteriostatic. We're gonna see this in some of the labs that we do and also in other lectures. So whenever you hear bacteriostatic, think stasis, staying still, okay slowing stopping there is no more growth of that organism okay now when you think of that think of what happens if you end up below temperature or if you put food below temperature think of things like freezing okay so very cold temperature stops growth whereas if a temperature is above the maximum what does that mean well very hot temperatures, they're going to destroy. They're going to cause death. Okay, that's why heating things, okay, cooking food is done because that kills microbes, okay? And what we call that is bactericidal. So when you hear cidal at the end of a word, like genocidal, suicidal, homicidal, that means death or killing, okay? So high temperatures kill, cold temperatures stop growth. But notice, what am I not saying about cold temperatures? They're not killing, okay? So always remember that when you put food in the fridge or the freezer. You don't wanna keep it there forever because you are not killing the microbes. You're just slowing down their growth, but they're still there and they can still eventually grow, okay? So now when we talk about temperature requirements, we have three main categories. You have to remember these terms. Okay, we have psychrophiles, we have mesophiles, and we have thermophiles. Okay, the psychrophiles, I like to call them the psychophiles, they like really cold temperatures. Okay, you can see on the slide that I put the range from minus 5 to 20 degrees Celsius. Now, because they thrive in cold temperatures, you have to ask yourself, where might I find a psychrophile? Well, growing in the refrigerator, right? So it makes sense that these guys will cause food spoilage in your fridge, okay? The next category, I want you to put stars next to it, circle it, highlight it, that's mesophiles. When we talk about mesophiles, they like moderate temperatures, and I have the temperature range 20 to 45 written there. I want you to put little stars next to that temperature range and ask yourself, what falls in that range? Why is that range so important? Okay, ask yourself, well, what's 20 degrees Celsius? 
Think about it. That's room temperature, isn't it? So these guys can grow at room temperature. What else is in that range? Well, 37 degrees Celsius. Where have you heard of 37 degrees Celsius before? That's body temperature, right? So not only can these guys thrive at room temperature, but they can also thrive at body temperature, which means what are mesophiles going to be causing? Human illness. Okay, so it's very important for you to remember the significance of that temperature range for mesophiles. The last category is thermophiles, and when you hear thermo, you think heat. So these guys like high temperatures, greater than 45 degrees Celsius. And anytime you categorize a thermophile, I do not want you to use just the word thermophile. You have to be specific. You have to say, is it facultative? Is it obligate? Or is it extreme? Now, the easiest one to define is to think, think about obligate first. Ask yourself, if you are obligated to do something, what does that mean? You're required to do it, right? So obligate thermophiles require high temperatures. They will only grow above 45 degrees Celsius, okay? Whereas facultative, they are not obligated. They're not required to, okay? They just like high temperatures, but they can also grow below that. Okay, so a facultative thermophile will grow above 45 degrees Celsius, but also be able to grow below that, which means these guys can also grow at 37 degrees Celsius, which you have to remember that's body temperature. Okay, so they can cause a problem for us, the facultative thermophiles. Then the last one is extreme thermophiles. And if anything's extreme, that means crazy high, okay? So extreme thermophiles you will find above 80 degrees Celsius, okay? Now, to help you visualize these, we have a figure on the next slide. Okay, so when you look at this figure, you can see in order we have the psychrophiles, the mesophiles, and the thermophiles. Now you also see a curve for hyperthermophiles. What do you think those are? Well, those are the extreme thermophiles we mentioned, okay? So when you look at this, it's just to help you better visualize, but you have to understand what's on the previous slide more importantly, okay? Now, in addition to temperature, you also have pH as a critical physical requirement. Now, most organisms, most cells, just like even in our body, they prefer a pH of 7. Okay? What is a pH of 7? That's neutral, right? Now, as you can see by the figure, that little picture or cartoon that I put on this slide, the reason why cells prefer a neutral pH is that if you have the wrong pH, well, enzymes do not like that. And if enzymes get denatured, then a cell will not be able to function. Okay, now some cells, some microbes can survive out of that neutral range. If they like acidic pH, okay, if they can survive in very low pH, then these guys you would call acidophiles. And you have to ask yourself, where might you find some? Okay, think about your body. Where are the acidic regions of your body? The stomach, right? That's a big one. Okay, the GI tract, your gut. So any of the organisms that you might have thriving there, they would have to be acidophiles. Now, there are quite a few acidophiles that we may encounter, but on the opposite side of that spectrum, alkaline environments, there tend not to be many microbes that can survive alkaline, and alkaline is just a fancy way of saying basic, right? So when you think of it that way, that's why a lot of disinfectants are alkaline, okay? Things like ammonia, because even though we have a lot of microbes that can survive acidic, don't really have many that can survive alkaline, okay? Now, in addition to temperature and pH, we have osmotic pressure. And yes, that little gift cartoon in the corner, that is one of my favorites, okay? 
Now, when we talk about osmotic pressure, you have to think about salt. And this can be a reminder of when we drew out or thought about hypertonic and hypotonic environments, okay? If there's tons of salt in an environment, what happens to that cell? Well, salty, you dry out, right? Shriveled up, think of eating something really salty. Even though it's delicious, you need a lot of water after, okay? And cells do not like that. It can be very dangerous for them. So when we're talking about salt content in the environment, if a bacteria or if a microbe is capable of surviving in high salt, we call them a halophile. Now there's a magic number I want you to put a star next to and write down, and that is 3%. 3% is the salt content value that I want you to remember, okay? If a microbe can grow above 3%, that's when we will categorize it as a halophile, right? If it's below 3% growing and it cannot survive above 3%, if it dies above that, then we consider it not to be a halophile. That's just normal bacteria, okay? The normal range for bacteria is 0.5 to 3% salt. So above that is when it becomes a halophile category. Now, just like we categorize the thermophiles, you also can categorize halophiles based on their salt preferences. Okay, it's the same terminology. You have obligate, you have facultative, and you have extreme. So ask yourself, what did we say about obligate? Well, it's obligated. Okay, so obligate halophiles are obligated or required to have high salt. You will only see them growing above 3%. They will not grow below that. Facultative, on the other hand, they can grow above or below 3%. Okay, so if you see something growing above 3%, that tells you it's a halophile. And if it's still growing below that, it is facultative. If it is only growing above, it's obligate. And then the last one is extreme which means a concentration of about 30%, even 20% sometimes we consider extreme halophiles. Okay, so you can visualize this, this uh, a little bit better when we do the laboratory exercise on it. Now we're gonna go through the chemical requirements, okay? Now with each of these, you have to ask yourself, what would a cell need this chemical for? So the first category of chemical requirements CHO, which is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, these are critical. Put a little star next to the title of this one because these three are necessary for all cells to build their biomolecules. And when we talked about biomolecules, that was nucleic acids, carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins, okay? Without carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, these cannot be made, okay? Also have, then you also have nitrogen. Nitrogen, I write out as NAN, N-A-N, to remind myself that nitrogen is required for amino acids and nucleic acids, okay? So when you see those words, you have to ask yourself, well, what is the cell actually building? Well, amino acids, that's proteins, right? That's the building blocks of proteins. And nucleic acids are for DNA, RNA, and ATP. Okay, so nitrogen is needed to make proteins and to make things like DNA and RNA. Okay, so very important nitrogen. Then we have sulfur. And with sulfur, I want you to circle methionine. Circle the word methionine or met. This you should remember from when we did the genetics lesson, okay? F-met, F-met was the initiator amino acid, which means methionine is the first amino acid of any protein, okay? So without sulfur, which is part of methionine, cells would not be able to build any proteins, okay? So sulfur is very critical.
Then you have phosphorus, and phosphorus is important for nucleic acids, phospholipid bilayer, and ATP. Okay, so again, whenever you see nucleic acids, you have to tell yourself DNA, RNA, and ATP. Okay, and then the phospholipid bilayer, that's the outer membrane of a cell. That's what gives it its structure and protects it. So without phosphorus, you would not have a cell. The last of these chemical requirements are potassium, magnesium, calcium, and iron. Okay, so we have some minerals here. These are all cofactors. Okay, so you should remember that from our previous lectures. And when you see cofactors, you can underline factor and remind yourself the little trick of factories. Think of a factory with metals and minerals, okay? So these are inorganics that help activate enzymes. Enzymes would not function without them, okay? What was the other word that we learned with this? Cofactors are inorganic and coenzymes, which are vitamins, are organic, okay? Both are needed to help enzymes function. The next thing to mention is oxygen. So this is different from when we said carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Okay, when we talked about those, we're talking about, for instance, breaking down um, foods, plants to get that piece of oxygen. The oxygen on this slide, however, is talking about atmospheric oxygen. Okay, taking an atmospheric oxygen, big difference. Okay, so they all need the oxygen of carbon hydrogen oxygen but they do not all require atmospheric oxygen and in fact some bacteria get killed by atmospheric oxygen okay so i write out a few different categories here for explaining the oxygen requirements of bacteria okay so the thing about oxygen or atmospheric oxygen is that it causes free radicals. And free radicals in the atmosphere or in an organism's cells are unstable. Okay, free radicals, I'm sure you've heard this, this as a bad thing, because they are unstable and they steal electrons from other molecules. Now, if they're stealing electrons from other molecules, what happens to those molecules that lost their electrons? Well, now they're unstable. Now they want to steal more electrons, okay? So you have this chain of events of atoms becoming unstable, which is a big problem for a cell, and that can kill it, okay? Now, if a cell has what's called superoxide dismutase, okay, SOD, I have it written in blue on the slide, you can circle and put stars next to that word superoxide dismutase, okay? If a cell can make that enzyme, then it can break down or convert free radicals to safe oxygen, okay? A lot of times it also uses catalase and peroxidase. Now you don't have to memorize or know the chemical formulas or the biochemistry behind this, simply know that the enzyme superoxide dismutase, or SOD, converts dangerous or toxic free radicals to safe oxygen. So if I'm a cell and I can produce that enzyme, then I can make the atmosphere safe for me, okay? Any of the ones that can do that can survive atmospheric oxygen, and they are called aerobes, okay? aerobes, either obligate or facultative. If, however, a bacteria cannot produce that, does not have that, it is called an obligate anaerobe, meaning it requires a lack of oxygen. If it encounters oxygen in the atmosphere, what will happen? It'll die. It will die because the free radicals will make it unstable and it has no way to counteract the free radicals okay so aerobes produce superoxide dismutase and protect themselves obligate anaerobes do not you also see a couple of extra categories
guys, which are error tolerant or micro error files. These guys can survive in oxygen, meaning that they do have uh, the enzymes such as catalase to protect themselves, but they don't actually use oxygen or they need it at a low concentration. Okay, but what I really want you to remember is aerobe versus obligate anaerobe, the concept of superoxide dismutase. Okay. Now, beyond the requirements for growth, you have to think about the ways in which bacteria grow or microbes grow. And one way that they grow, some of them, is as biofilms. And when you hear the word biofilm, there are two things I want you to remember. One is the definition, which is that a biofilm is a whole bunch of different species of bacteria that stick together into this big collection, working together, protecting each other, all different species. Okay, which means that they are a lot harder for us to destroy. An example of that, which is the other thing I want you to remember about biofilms, is plaque on the teeth. Okay, plaque on the teeth. And a lot of these guys in biofilms, what they will have is a glycocalyx, which we already mentioned in previous lessons. That is basically that sticky slime layer around them, a capsule around them which is why they're able to stick to things such as your teeth. Okay, but for biofilms, remember it's a whole bunch of different bacteria working together, and the example is plaque. Now, when we talk about the growth of bacteria, you also have to think about how they replicate. Okay, the way that bacteria replicate is through binary fission. So as you can see in this figure, one cell splitting into two. Now notice what do they have to do before they split, before they undergo that mitosis, they have to replicate their DNA. Okay, so we mentioned that when we talked about the genetics lesson. Okay, now the next slide is very important. The, the four phases to bacterial population growth. I want you to put stars next to this slide, you should be able to understand the four phases. You should be able to name them and to make a key point about each one. Okay, so the four phases are the lag phase, the log phase, stationary phase, and the death phase. Okay? And the way that you can visualize them is on the next slide, and during, I'll put the next slide on the screen, but I will explain what we have on this slide as we're looking at the next slide, okay? So looking at our, so looking at our four stages, like I said, you have to know your four stages, lag, log, stationary, and death, okay? Sometimes, as you can see in this figure, we call the exponential, uh, the, the log phase, we can call exponential. And sometimes they'll throw in at the very end a long-term stationary phase, but you don't have to know that. You have to know lag, log, stationary, and death. So what happens at the lag phase, you'll notice at that phase you don't have many bacteria yet. Okay? You do not have any division occurring. And instead, the bacteria at this point, they're just getting used to things. Okay. They're getting their enzymes ready. They have to start transcription, translation. Remember, we said these things take time, okay? Once they finish with that, then they move on to the log phase. And now is when you have binary fission, okay? Since you have binary fission, the numbers are increasing exponentially, okay? But this is only when conditions are favorable. Now, Circle on your slides the fact that log phase, the bacteria are metabolically active. Okay, circle or write metabolically active in the log phase. That's very important because if a bacteria is metabolically active, that is when it is sensitive to drugs and antibiotics, okay, to your treatment as nurses or as doctors. Okay. 
Once it's made it through there, you'll notice that our curve starts to flat line up at the top. Okay, that's now the stationary phase. The reason why it's flat lining is because the cell death is equal to the cell division rate. Okay, and you have to ask yourself, why is this happening? Why are they starting to die at the same rate that they're dividing? Well, look at the figure. You notice space gets crowded, okay? When there are too many bacteria, they can't properly survive. And when there are too many bacteria now, they release a lot of waste. Think about it. They're not just eating and growing and replicating, but they're also excreting which means they now have a lot of waste and gas and toxins built up there. Okay, so they start to die off. And then as they start to die off more than they replicate, you notice you get the plummeting curve, which is the death phase. Okay, so now the cell death rate is greater than cell division. And that's because they've used up their nutrients. Okay, they've used up the nutrients. There are too many wastes built up and too many bacteria there, okay? So you have to know lag, log, stationary death, and what's happening at each one, okay? So lag is the prep phase. Log is when they're metabolically active and replicating. Stationary is when you have too many of them building up. And death phase is once they're now used up nutrients, there's too many wastes, and they're dying off. Now, when we talk about growth requirements, you have to ask yourself in terms of our labs, in terms of medical research, well, if we know the growth requirements, then how can we culture these bacteria? And that's where culture medium comes in, which you've worked with in the lab already. Okay? If it is in the plate form, the solid form that we've worked with, which is kind of like a jello form, that is called agar. Okay? It's got solidifying agents. The media also needs to have ex extracts and these are important for giving it all of those chemical requirements we mentioned earlier. So the yeast, the meat, the plants, they give it things like the carbon, sulfur, the phosphates that we talked about earlier. And ultimately that is why the media is so important. It's giving the bacteria what they need to grow. Now, media is also very valuable to us in the medical field and the research field because we have different types of media. And these different types of media allow us to do things like diagnose. The two main categories that really help us in terms of diagnosing or working with various bacteria are selective and differential media. And you have to know the difference between selective aspects of media and differential aspects of media. Okay, so put a star on this slide because you will be asked about it again in the future. So first we have the idea of selective media. Selective means you're selecting for something. Okay, so you will either see growth or no growth there will be inhibitors in this kind of media that block certain bacteria from growing, okay? So the picture that we have on the slide, this plate here, that's an MSA plate, mannitol salt agar, okay? The fact that it has salt in it is what makes it selective, okay? So if I ever ask you the selective aspect of an MSA plate, well, that's the salt, okay? because as you know, only halophiles can grow in high salt. Then what else do you notice about that plate? Well, you notice you see different colors, okay? So when you see the word differential media, I want you to underline different in it, okay? Underline different in it and write for yourself different colors, okay? So the differential aspect of the plate that you see on that screen is that red media turns to yellow if the bacteria can ferment. 
mannitol sugar. Okay, and so what you notice is on an MSA plate, Staph aureus turns the plate yellow. And that's critical when you want to distinguish pathogens. Because when you look at that plate on the screen, well, Staph epidermidis, it looks red, but Staph aureus looks yellow. Well, what do you know about Staph epidermidis? Epidermis, skin. It's a normal flora on your skin. Whereas Staph aureus, well, when you hear MRSA or MRSA, you get scared because Staph aureus is a bad pathogen. Okay, so you want to have media that can quickly tell you which of these two you have that your patient is dealing with. Okay, now a lot of plates are both selective and differential at the same time. So you'll notice in the picture, MSA plates are selective for salt at the same time that they change color for a differential aspect. Okay, but know the difference between selective aspect and the differential aspect. Another type of media that I want you to be familiar with is reducing media. Now, reducing media, you don't have to memorize or know the actual mechanism that it's working by. I just want you to be aware that reducing media exists, and specifically, sometimes you'll hear the term thioglycolate, okay, that's in the second bullet point here. Whenever you hear thioglycolate or reducing media, simply know that that's for growing or categorizing anaerobic bacteria, okay, bacteria that can not survive in the presence of oxygen, okay? And what's cool about the thioglycolate is because it removes or uses up the oxygen in the media, we can grow or put bacteria into a tube of this and we can see, does the bacteria stay at the very top and grow, meaning that it wants the oxygen from the atmosphere, or does it only grow at the bottom where the thioglycolate has used up oxygen? Okay, so very valuable to have reducing media. But just as soon as you hear reducing or thioglycolate, think anaerobic. The next thing that I want you to know is how to preserve bacterial cultures. So again, we're not going to go into the crazy mechanisms of these, but I just want you to be aware that sometimes we need to preserve bacteria so that, for instance, we can ship it to labs or so that you can send out your patient's culture to other research facilities to try and figure out more about what, what is ailing them. And so two of the ways to preserve bacterial cultures are deep freezing or lyophilization. And lyophilization is just a fancy way of saying freeze and dry out. Now, what I want you to know for here is just like we mentioned in the previous slide, I want you to be able to know that these terms exist and what they're for. So if you hear lyophilization, or if you see that word, instantly think preserving, okay? Now we get to the part of the lesson that the nursing students and the med students like the most, okay? This is the most applicable to you guys. This is the control of microbial growth. Now you'll notice that a lot of this section is terminology, so make sure that you're comfortable with the definitions and with also comparing different terms that are kind of related to each other. So if you see more than one term on a slide, make sure that you can explain the difference between them, which is basically, again, understanding the definition. And if you're given an example, make sure to know the example as well, okay? So the first category we have, sepsis versus asepsis. Okay, sepsis is a term that you will hear a lot, unfortunately, in hospitals now. It is a big killer of a lot of patients, and what's actually killing them is you guys, the medical professionals. The medical professionals are spreading infections to their patients without realizing it when they're not thinking in terms of microbiology. Okay, so when you hear sepsis or septic, that means that there is bacteria present, okay, bacterial contamination. Whereas when you hear asepsis or aseptic, 
that means sterile, no bacteria. Okay, so you want aseptic conditions. You want asepsis. Then we have three terms that I'm sure you hear all of the time, but still so many times students don't actually know what they mean or how to distinguish them. Okay, so I want you to put a star next to this slide and make sure you know the difference between disinfection and antisepsis. Okay, meaning the difference between using a disinfectant versus using an antiseptic. Okay, this is important because I never want to see you trying to put bleach on one of your patient's skin, okay? Because bleach is a disinfectant, whereas only antiseptics get used on patient's skin, okay? So disinfectant or disinfections, these are things that you use to kill microbes on inanimate objects. So for instance, cleaning a table, cleaning, desks or pens or pencils, any, anything like that, that's disinfection, okay? Using Clorox, Lysol, that's disinfectants. Whereas antiseptics, what you can do is you can underline TIS in the word antisepsis or antiseptics. That tells you that you're using these on living tissues. Okay, TIS, just like tissues, living tissues and skin. So for instance, when you use Purell, that's an antiseptic. When you use iodine on your patient or alcohol, okay? Now, another term that's related to these, but also different is sterilization. And what sterilization means is you are getting rid of 100% of the microbes. Now, why is sterilization considered different or separate from disinfection and antisepsis? Well, think about what you see on your Purell or your Lysol and Clorox. What does it always say? Kills what? 99.9%, .9%, okay? It does not kill 100%. If you want sterilization, then you'll have to look for some other means. So for instance, things like autoclaving or gaseous agents, but these are things that cannot be used on patients. Okay. So a lot of times sterilization has the downside that it would be too dangerous for patients. Now some more terminology we have here. We have first up de-germing. Okay. Notice de-germing is removal of microbes by physical means. You are not killing them. You're just physically wiping them off or washing them off. So the picture on here, the germing would be washing your hands, for instance, okay? Because you're using water and you're using the movement of your hands to brush off microbes. Sanitization, that's when you disinfect someplace used by the public, okay? So if you were to clean the desks in the school or go to the court cafe and wash those desks, uh, sorry, wash those tables. Or even for instance, in, in a restaurant like McDonald's or something, you're wiping down, you're disinfecting those tables. That's sanitization, okay? Whereas if you're just wiping down, cleaning your own personal kitchen table that's not used by the public, then that's just disinfecting, okay? So sanitization or sanitizing is specific to something used in the public. Then we have pasteurization, and you ask yourself, where do you hear this term? Milk, right? Milk is pasteurized. So what they do is they heat to kill the pathogens, but they're not sterilizing. They're not killing 100%. And if you think about our example of milk, if you try to heat it to a temperature that would sterilize, well, you would curdle the milk, you would make the milk no longer good, okay? So it's kind of, they, they want to heat it to the point that you get rid of a lot of the pathogens, but they can't completely sterilize it because that would destroy the product. And then we have two terms that you have seen before that we've mentioned earlier, which is bactericidal versus bacteriostatic, and you have to know the difference between these. Okay, these terms will keep coming up throughout the semester. So remember, cytal kills.
static slows or stops. And always ask yourself in terms of temperature, what's bactericidal? Very hot, right? Things like fire, flames, cooking. What's bacteria static? That would be cold temperatures, putting something in the fridge, in the freezer, okay? Then we have here various factors that can affect the rate of microbial death, okay, from antimicrobials. Now that's a fancy way of saying, for each of these factors, you have to ask yourself, okay, does this factor make it more likely that microbes will be killed? Does it make it easier to kill the microbes? Or does it make it harder where less microbes will be killed? Okay, so you're increasing the rate of microbial death if it's something that makes it easier to kill microbes, okay? The first category that we have is the number of organisms. Okay, the number of organisms Think about it, if there are more microbes present, more bacteria, is it going to be easier or harder to kill them? Okay, it'll be harder to kill them, right? It'll take a longer time. So more microbes decreases the rate of microbial death from antimicrobials. It makes it harder to kill them. The second thing we have is duration of treatment, okay? The longer you apply a disinfectant or an antiseptic to something to try and kill bacteria, the more of it you will kill. Okay? This duration aspect is why alcohol is not a great antimicrobial because think of it, what does alcohol do very quickly? It evaporates. So that's short duration of treatment. Okay? If you're not going to have that chemical on the surface for very long, it's not going to kill as much bacteria. Okay, so longer increases the rate, whereas shorter decreases the rate of microbial death. Okay. Then we have temperature. And if you think about it, lower temperatures like the cold take longer to kill microbes. It preserves them. Whereas hotter temperatures, what are hotter temperatures do? They're bactericidal, right? So they kill better. Okay, they help you kill the microbes quicker. Then we have the next one, which is my favorite. That's the environment. But when we talk about the environment, we don't mean trees and, and greenery and all of the environmental stuff like that. What we mean here is the presence of organic material. All the fun stuff that nurses love dealing with, like vomit, blood, pus, saliva, urine, any of that. Okay. These organic materials, they decrease or drop the rate of microbial death by antimicrobials for a couple of reasons, okay? If you picture these, picture, I know you don't want to do this, but picture a whole bunch of vomit right on your patient's lap, right? And you go to clean it up. Well, microbes can be hiding in all of those little crevices, okay? It gives them protection. It makes them less accessible to you, okay? So it protects them and decreases the rate of death. It also helps destroy some of the chemicals that you will try to use to kill them, okay? So certain things like vomit sometimes, the, the pH of it or various aspects of it can kind of help break down disinfectants and make them less effective, okay? So organics are bad for trying to kill microbes. Then the last category we have are endospore formation. And for that, you just have to think of what exactly is an endospore, okay? And we mentioned those are basically those nice protective little escape pods. They're very resistant. So if they're very resistant, then what does that tell you about you trying to kill them with antimicrobials? It's gonna make your job a lot harder, isn't it? Okay, so endospore formation will decrease the rate of microbial death. It will make it harder for you to kill the bacterial infection if they are capable of making endospores. Okay, so again, for any of these factors, you have to ask yourself, will it make it easier or harder for me to kill the microbe?
Then we think about what are some actual examples of antimicrobials and how are they working? Okay, so you don't have to memorize all of these, but I will have you star certain ones to focus on. Okay, the first one we mentioned are phenols. These are very rough, harsh agents. They tend to destroy bacteria by messing up their plasma membranes and by denaturing their proteins. Then we have alcohol. I want you to put a star next to that, put a star next to it, and ask yourself, why is this one not a great antimicrobial? Well, we just mentioned it a minute ago. It evaporates too quickly. Okay? It evaporates too quickly. So whenever you see alcohol, that's what I want you to remember. Then we have iodine and chlorine. Okay, so iodine you've probably encountered in the hospital already. Whenever you see the word tincture, that simply means that it's been mixed with alcohol. Okay, certain things they mix with alcohol to kind of combine the antimicrobial activities or because it doesn't work as well without that solution. Then you have surfactants, and notice I put two of these in red. Put a little star next to these guys. I want you to remember the difference between soaps and detergents. Okay, two terms you hear all of the time, and people tend to use them interchangeably, but they're very different in micro. Okay, there's a very big distinction between them. And what that is, is that soaps simply make things slippery, okay, which means they're good at de-germing, because remember, we said de-germing means that you wash away, you physically brush off bacteria, get rid of it. But what are you not doing to it? You're not killing it which means that it's a poor antimicrobial. Whereas detergents kill the microbes. Detergents, they disrupt or destroy the membrane, the outer part of the bacterial cell, which means they are great antimicrobials. They kill the bacteria, okay? So remember, slippery soaps are not good antimicrobials. They're not killing, whereas detergents are killing bacteria. Okay. The last one I want you to remember is gaseous agents. Put a little star next to that one because what do you notice? All capital letters. Gaseous agents sterilize. Okay. They sterilize because they could get into every little crevice, every little pore of that microbe. Okay. The problem with them though is they're usually too harsh to be used anywhere where a human would be. Okay, so you have to think about, yes, I want an antimicrobial that will kill as much bacteria as possible, but I also don't want to hurt the humans that are around there. Okay, so it's a tricky little uh, juggling act that you have to do. Now, when you want to see how well, when you want to see how well a chemical agent works, we use the disk diffusion method, which you guys will actually be doing in the lab, okay? And one of the examples of this will be Kirby Bauer in the lab, but you could do it with any disinfectant or antibiotics as well. Basically, what you do is you swab up one of the agar plates that we use in lab. You completely swab it with the bacteria of your choice. So for instance, here we have Staph aureus, E. coli, Pseudomonas. So you completely swab it, and then you place these small white filter disks on top of it. And these filter disks, you first soak with the disinfectant. You then incubate the plate, and you see where does the bacteria grow? Where does it not grow? So you'll notice that for some of these, like around chlorine, you have this big circle, this big zone of inhibition where no bacteria grew because that disinfectant killed the bacteria. It's very good at killing, okay? That big zone means that that bacteria is very sensitive or susceptible to that disinfectant, okay? So you would want to pick that disinfectant to kill it. Whereas you'll notice Pseudomonas all the way on the right, chlorine works a little bit, but it's not as susceptible. Instead, it's rather resistant, okay? Any of the ones where you see 
the disc with no empty halo around it, no zone of inhibition, that means that that bacteria is resistant to those, micro, to those uh, disinfectants, okay? So for instance, you would not want to select hexachlorophene to try and kill Pseudomonas or E. coli because notice that the bacteria grew right up against the disc, no problem. Okay, they were resistant to it. The last thing that I wanna mention is some physical methods to control microbial growth, okay? Physical methods include heat, filtration, temperature, high pressure, desiccation, osmotic pressure, and radiation. Okay, so when we talk about heat, you notice there are two forms. There's moisture heat and there's dry heat. So in the lab, we use a lot of times the incinerators on your desks. That is dry heat, or if we use a Bunsen burner, that's dry heat. And those sterilize, okay? they completely kill bacteria. We also use the autoclave, which is this giant metal contraption down the hall that also sterilizes, and that one sterilizes by using high pressure and water and steam, very high temperature. There's also filtration, which we'll talk about in a minute, and why we use heat versus filtration. Then there are low temperatures, and for low temperatures, notice we said we're doing microbial control. We did not necessarily say we're trying to kill the bacteria that bacteria. Okay, so low temperatures, unlike heat, low temperatures will just slow the growth. So just remember that when you deal with putting food in the refrigerator, in the freezer, you can't leave it there forever. Okay, in the fridge, you only want to leave it for a few days, in the freezer, maybe a few months, and then toss it out because the bacteria does still grow. It's just at a very, very slow rate. Okay, high pressure, that's important as a microbial control because that can denature proteins. So that's why the autoclave not only uses high temperature, but it also uses high pressure, okay? Because denaturing proteins, that kills bacteria, okay? So it's bactericidal. Then we have desiccation, and desiccation is a fancy way of saying completely drying out, okay? So if you shrivel the cells, if you get rid of their water, you've now killed them. That prevents metabolism, that prevents any of their reactions from going on, okay? You also have osmotic pressure, which we've mentioned before. Osmotic pressure is using salt. So think about when they used to preserve foods by having lots of salt, okay? Like preserving meats with tons of salt because that is a hypertonic condition, okay? So it shrivels up the cells and they cannot perform their life functions. The last one here is radiation, and radiation, as many people tend to know already, damages DNA, okay? So it's not just a problem for the bacteria, but it's also dangerous for us as well, okay? So there are just a couple of these I want to give you a little more information on before we finish up. The first one here, we have autoclaves. And in giant letters on here, I want you to write sterilizes. Okay, autoclaves sterilize. They kill 100% of the microbes, including any endospores. So that means any of those highly resistant cells. And they do this by using very high temperatures and extreme pressure, which we just mentioned a minute ago, that denatures proteins. Okay, and in the figure here, you see the two different colors of the tape. You have the yellow and the blue tape. That's basically just so that the person autoclaving knows that that reached the proper temperature and pressure to be sterilized, okay? But for autoclaves, I want you to know, high heat, high pressure, sterilizes. Now, we also have filters as an option. I want you to know the difference between using an autoclave and using a filter. So we said autoclaves are great in that they sterilize 100%. But ask yourself, when can't you use an autoclave? Well, 
certain materials, if you were to put them in high temperature, high pressure, certain containers might completely melt, collapse, break. Certain reagents, what can happen if you put them in high temperatures, boom, they might be flammable, okay? You might cause an explosion or a fire, okay? You can destroy what you're working on with an autoclave in some con in certain scenarios, okay? So filters you use when you cannot use high heat, okay? So when would you wanna use a filter? when you can't use high heat. When the heat would destroy your, your container, your, your sample, or when things are flammable, okay? So instead you put them through a filter. Now notice what is a filter doing? It's separating things out, right? What's it not doing? It is not killing the bacteria. It's just removing them, okay? So keep in mind the difference in this. And filter size matters. So depending on the pore size will determine how much microbes you get rid of, okay? And you'll notice HEPA filters. Those are the ones you hear with your air conditioning units in your houses, okay? They will have bigger pores, whereas membrane filters are more expensive. Those are the ones we use in research. Those have much smaller pores to really cut down on the microbes. The last thing to mention is radiation. So this is in things like microwaving your food, okay? Now with radiation, as we've mentioned before, and you've probably heard previously throughout your life, radiation is dangerous in that it breaks DNA. So it not only breaks the DNA of the bacteria, but it can also break your own DNA. So always be careful with the idea of radiation as an antimicrobial. Now with the way microwaves work, they're not just using radiation in the sense of trying to break DNA, they're producing heat. And as you know, what does heat do? Heat kills microbes. It is bactericidal, okay? So you want to just remind yourself in terms of radiation or in terms of any of the antimicrobial techniques we talked about, how is it good at killing microbes, but why can't we use it under certain conditions, okay? What's the downsides or limitations with it, okay? So normally we would have you put the questions on the board, but today instead I will have you have an assignment in terms of writing these. We may get to put them on the board or I may just have you post them online, okay? Thank you.